entertaining fun cricketers to ever play the game, and that's just in the change rooms. He played 26 tests, 198 one days, and was an integral part of Australia winning the 2003 World Cup in South Africa. He is Andrew Roy Simons. Welcome to Cricket Legends, Andrew. Thanks, Crash. Thanks for having me. I'm not sure I'm a legend, but uh, it's nice to be here. <laughs> well, I'll tell you one thing you've done. I've heard a lot of sportsmen say, oh, when I retire, I'm just going to buy a boat and maybe head to the tropics. And you're the only person I've known who's actually done it, haven't you? Tell us about the life you lead. Um, yeah, I, I lead a, a fairly simple life, which is, um, I suppose, the way I've always wanted it, and you don't always get what you want. So my wife got a job in in uh, Townsville uh, when I finished playing sort of thing and we moved up there and I've been there for 10 years now and I grew up uh, in Charters Towers, went to school there so it was, it was it's good to be back in the north, um, there's no traffic jams, not many traffic lights and um, there's plenty of things to catch and kill mate. One passion which has endured is your love of rugby league and uh, that was one of the most interesting threads of your career, that little time in 2002 when you almost gave cricket away to, to have a crack at joining the Broncos. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, I, was, I went through a period, you know, playing shield cricket and that, and I wasn't... The cons I didn't have the consistency that was required of me to sort of um, edge out a successful career. And I was on the verge of probably being dropped from the state side. I'd been training with the Broncos and what have you, and Wayne Bennett was um, sort of instrumental in welcoming me and, and making me fit into the, to the club. And, you know, I sort of threw up the idea that would it be possible for me to look at going down the avenue of, of playing rugby league, you know, if my cricket wasn't to work out? Uh, and he said, yeah, no, that'll be no problem if you want to you want to pursue that. But later on that year, that season, I got selected in the in the World Cup side to go to South Africa. You did pull off one big hit, uh, a shoulder charge in Brisbane, of course, at the Gabba, but it was on a streaker uh, during a one-day game against India. It's funny, like, for some of your mates, that was the highlight of your career, wasn't it? Like, talk us through that. Yeah, I think that's um, possibly the, the thing that I'm remembered for. Um, but we were playing a final against India at the Gabba in Brisbane. I remember when he sort of jumped over the fence, the players and everyone sort of looked over to that corner of the ground and he had nothing but a stubby cool around his wrist and he was running... I remember he got to about, I don't know, 15, 20 metres away from me and we sort of caught, we caught, out, caught eyes and uh, I looked at him and I sort of smirked and I sort of thought, yeah, come over here, dickhead. <laughs> and um, so he came towards me and I sort of swapped my bat into my non-dominant side so I could use my right shoulder. And as Tony Carroll taught me, work from low to high and try and get up under the ribs. And um, if you can get them in the air, then try and land on them and try and hurt them a second time. So I never got to get him a second time, but I got a pretty good shot on him. I want to go back to the start of your life, and, and you actually started your book by saying, the thing about being adopted for me was, it was no big drama, I always knew, and it just sort of ventilated the issue. So you, 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 know, you were made aware, obviously, very early in life that by, yeah. by Ken and Barbara? Yes, I mean, it's, ever since I could understand English, I, I knew that I was adopted. Um, you know, and you hear horror stories of people not knowing till they're you know, 20 years old or something like that. But uh, I always knew and I always saw mum and dad as mum and dad. Yeah. It's funny because it was like, uh, it was literally like buying a new motor car because I was about, I don't know, I was about six weeks old and so mum and dad got to have a test drive. <laughs> and uh, I think they were allowed to take me home for, I think it was a week or something like this and if everything was working okay, um, they would sign the paperwork and I'd, I'd be theirs. So mum tells me that uh, she took me home and I just, I just wouldn't sleep and I would, I'd play it up like cried and, you know, you know a, child, a difficult child for a week. And uh, mum's a very determined woman, so she was um, of the opinion that, you know, she was not going to back down. She wasn't going to give up in a week. Um, so she went, when they went back to the, to the clinic or whatever it was, they said, how did, they, how did you go? And he said, yeah, no, everything was good. Uh, he was fine. Uh, you know, we'd like to take him home. So, um, yeah, so they signed up and, um, yeah, the rest is history. Home I went with mum and dad. Your life changed as a teenager when you scored a century for Queensland against England, a touring England team in Toowoomba. And then the question was asked about your eligibility because, of course, you were English-born. And then you went to play for Gloucestershire. It became a big deal, didn't it? Like, who's Andrew Simons going to play for? Were you close to joining England? Was there ever, ever a point where it was, like, really 50-50? 
No, there was never a moment in 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 my head that I was ever going to try and play for England. My childhood dream was was to play for Australia. Um, and yeah, it, it, so that was never really on the radar. The great turning point in your cricket career was being chosen for the World Cup, as you mentioned, in 2003. Your form wasn't great. Uh, it turned out to be a great selection. Were you shocked to be in initially? Absolutely. I remember um, we were at training and the team was announced and uh, I can't remember who it was. They <laughs> came over to me and said, oh, you've been picked, to, picked in the World Cup squad. And I said, no, no, no not possible. He said, yeah, you have. I said, well, I said, OK. And I sort of looked around, and there was, you know, there was, there was blokes like Brad Hodge and um, and these sorts of fellows that hadn't been picked. And I thought, well, I thought, she's she's a bit a bit lucky here, you know. And anyway, so, you know, not my problem, I suppose. I just had to apply myself to what op the opportunity I've been given, and just be prepared in case I had to play. And as it turned out, uh, I did. I was required straight away because um, Michael Bevan had torn his groin. And Darren Lehman had been suspended for a, a racial slur. Warney sent home. And Warney was sent home the night before the first game. Mm -hmm. And you could sense that the whole sort of cricketing world thought we were vulnerable. You know, Australia was... We could knock Australia off here. So we were, we were reeling, yes. But I think quietly um, we had a very good leader in Ricky Ponding and that was his determination and will to win is, is second to none, I suppose. Isn't that incredible that day? Like, Wasi Makram, Waka Yunus... Pakistan, all those players absent, you're out of form. Like, you couldn't have had a bigger challenge, yet the century you scored virtually pointed your career in a different direction. Was there anything that happened in the first few minutes of the crease you think, this is my day, or did it just sort of rush upon you? It did, I certainly didn't think this is my day, um, because when the, when the fourth wicket fell, I'm thinking, I don't really want to go out there and bat. I can think of ten better places to be. <laughs> it was... Uh, you're batting against a world-class attack, poking around early on. I was nervous, um, feet weren't moving, played and missed quite a bit and fortunately didn't, didn't nick one. But um, once I got into my innings, I really started to enjoy myself. And Wazzy Macram had always been a thorn in my side. He got me out for fun 90% of the time. I remember later on that day, I hit him over mid-on for six and it was one of the most satisfying shots, I think, in my career because he'd been such a you know, a burr under the saddle for me for so long and I hit him for six and I just sort of quietly had a little smirk inside, internally that I actually got the great man and then I hit it hard and flat and I sort of thought, yeah, that's have some of that was him, you know. <laughs> I guess your, your career changed direction with the infamous incident in Cardiff when you went out for Shane Watson's birthday, had too many to drink and was stood down for, for that reason the next day against Bangladesh and the team lost. How do you remember that experience? It's the night before we play Bangladesh and it's a Saturday night in Cardiff. And if anyone has ever been to Cardiff, has seen Cardiff in summer on a Saturday night, uh, it's, it's quite the place to be. So anyway, we went out for tea, had a nice meal, a um, couple of drinks, and then we came back to the hotel. I don't know, we probably got back to the hotel about 10 o'clock. And as you step out of the lift, you could look straight out the window and down the main street. And I went, hold on a second, fellas. I said, have a look at this. And the place is just jumping, you know. I said, uh, why don't we just duck back out for an hour and have a couple more drinks and then uh, we'll call it quits. Talked them into it. Back down we go back into town. And 10 o'clock turned into about 4, 4.30 uh, for some. And I got in at about 6.30, I think. Um, which I'm not proud of, and went to bed for about an hour. Boys did the ring around the morning, make sure everyone was up and going, and we get to warm-up time, and I'm still intoxicated. We started our stretching, and I put my foot up on a wheelie bin to, to stretch my hamstrings, and the, the wheelie bin started to get away from me. That's why they call them wheelie bin scratch. And, uh, yeah, to my demise, I think by this time, people had started to realise that I wasn't right. And uh, I remember Ricky coming over and he said, uh, mate, you're not playing today. You know, the day went on, I was in disgrace. Um, I was fined and sat down for a couple of days, a couple of games and, and what have you. So it was a very embarrassing period and um, something that, yeah, as I said, not proud of. During passages of that day, Michael Clark, I think, tried to cover your tracks. There was a period in your career where you were really close with him and then you seemed to, to fall out, to, to be... Like, you're not close now, are you? There, there, was there a, a, one incident which changed everything? Yeah, it's, it's probably, it's, it's something that probably 
happened over time. I think we just, I think we grew apart for, for a number of reasons. Through respect for him, I'm not going to divulge all that information. Um, but we, we, be, we grew apart, um, probably for the wrong reasons, and I'll, I'll probably accept responsibility for, for the most part of that. Um, some of the things I did were probably out of line, but you know, when he first came into the side, you know, I took him up into the north and went heli fishing and chasing pigs and riding motorbikes and all this sort of thing, and, and um, gave him an experience which he, he'd never had, and he, he he really enjoyed it, and I enjoyed taking him and seeing him in that environment was at times very humorous. You know, the the, the boys that were taking us around, we got a lot of who had a lot of fun, you know, and then things broke down um, for whatever reason, and. And we grew apart, and that's um, that's just the way the way it ended up. I did hear about one incident in the West Indies, and I think it's been written about where he he ch said to you it was time to go to bed, and you disagreed, and there might have been some wine thrown or something like that. Was that true? Or? Yeah, I threw a drink on him. Um, he didn't tell me to go to bed. He said something else, but I threw a drink on him, and what he said to me put me into a rage. You know, that was what he said to me wasn't was nowhere near accurate. And that was a, that that immediate point is where it, where he lost me and I lost him I think, um, and it was our friendship was was destroyed at that that moment. What did he say? He 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 had he'd said to me in, in not in these words but he, he'd suggested that I was a selfish player, selfish person, and the one thing that I don't consider myself to be um, is that, and that really. Uh, that really annoyed me. Andrew Simons is the new batsman. Fabulous cover drive. Oh, wow! So here he is, poised for something special. He has it! Andrew Simons has it! You little beauty! I've done a lot of things with Matty over the years, with my cricket. And, and, and with my life, and it was, um, I thought for me it was very... so much haven't you and the the photo of the two of you embracing was one of the iconic images of your career yeah absolutely i suppose you some of the if i if i had a flashback of some of the things that i've done with hados you know i can i can see us um sinking a boat swimming to shore um i can see us you know training really hard together hitting thousands of cricket balls together up in the gulf together i can see us on his farm together i can see it when he first had his see us when he first had his children to be able to play test cricket for your country on Boxing Day, which is the best test match you will ever play in. That's the test that you want to play. And to be able to score 100 with, with one of your best mates on that day. Uh, my grandfather had passed away earlier that year and he always used to come to Melbourne and watch me play. Um, and then to score test 100 with Matty and I felt like Grandad was there as well. So um, that was the, the embrace was pure, um, pure passion and I suppose like going through all that together and ground that up in the sky and all that sort of thing, that all sort of overflowed into the into the celebration and I actually hugged Hados that hard, I crushed his helmet into his head and he had a sort of a blood blister like a 50 cent piece on his forehead there. There was a fair bit of passion in the embrace. And you mentioned the boat you sunk together off Stradbroke Island when literally the two of you were swimming for your life, weren't you? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, bad. I, we could see the beach and I knew that I would make it and he knew that he'd make it. So he just took off when the boat went over, he just started swimming in. And I'm whistling at him, you know, he took a breath and he must have heard me and his ear coming out of the water and I said, oi, we've got Trent here. And Trent was in shock. So we had to sort of really nurse him through this swim back to the beach, but the current was taking us out and we're trying to go in. So we're working against nature. So we'd go for a little bit and then Trent would pull up and let him tread water and get his breath back. We go for a bit further, and anyway, so about the third time, I suppose, we, we took off to swim. Hayter grabbed me by the arm, pulled up, and said, oh, What do you reckon I just knock him out and we drag him in? This will be quicker. <laughs> and I said, He's not bad, is he? I said, 
That is a really bad idea. No, we're knocking that on the head. That's not happening. So we um, got under each arm and we got him in that last couple of hundred metres and he sort of flopped on the beach like, you know, I've never seen a man. Like, he was just so relieved to be on dry land. Um, it was unbelievable. But Hados reached into his togs and ripped out his sunglasses, which he'd managed to grab off the dashboard <laughs> before the boat went over. So, yeah, it was, um, it was quite the morning, that. Yeah, it was... Uh, got a bit of a fright there, mate. Let's talk about the, the Monkey Gate uh, affair when Harbour Jan Singh allegedly twice called you a monkey on the field in the Sydney Test. He was suspended and then that suspended suspension was downgraded uh, to a fine. Um, how, what was your initial reaction to that? It seemed that was the moment you lost trust in the game. Yeah, well, the way it unfolded, Crash, we played India in a one-day series in India before the Test Series here in Australia. And I believe it was the second ODI. He called me a monkey during that game. And at the end of the game, I went, in, I went round to their dressing shed. I knocked on the door and I said, um, I said, can I speak to Harbhajan outside, please? And he said, yeah, no worries. So he come, he come out the back and I said, look, um, the, the, mon the, the monkey, the name calling has got to stop, you know. Um, you know, we've got a few good names for some of your boys and I'm sure you've got some for ours. But it's going to get out of hand and, you know, there's damage going to be done and people are going to get sat down and all this sort of thing. So let's knock it on the head. He said, OK, boss, no worries. We shook hands and he went back into his shed, back in the Australian rooms. And then the return uh, the return series in, here in Australia about a month later, the New Year's test in Sydney, it happened again. And as you know, we sit down at the start of the season and we go through drugs, and alcohol, diet, racism, all this stuff, and we have to sign off on it. And we sit there for hours and days and listen to all this. And to be honest with you, we'd had enough. You know, it happened again. And there was four, four other Australian cricketers that heard it. You know, stump microphone footage disappeared. Um, Did it really? Yep. Wouldn't, it, was, it vanished. You and couldn't get the footage? No. You couldn't get you, the... The, the, when the replay was actually... The first replay, you could hear him say it. And then when we went, then it went as as the proceedings went on, it vanished. So that was probably the thing that was going we were gonna get him on. And then, you know, Cricket Australia asked us to downgrade the charge. We'd definitely get him on a, a 2.8 rather than a 3.2. And it just became very political. They threatened to go home, which Cricket Australia would have lost millions, tens of millions of dollars if they'd have left. And it was taking its toll on me big time. Because um, I had Gilchrist, Clark, Hayden and Ponting all involved so I felt hugely guilty for dragging them into this mess and um, you know I'd, I'd started to drink heavily and I was I was I you know I talked to Ricky and he said that was the start of you sort of your career sort of going downhill and, and I completely agree. Could you feel it like could you feel you were drinking more did you feel you were on the verge of becoming maybe an alcoholic like did you feel it wasn't that because I went through I went through well I, I got uh, I went through a proper uh, system where I was I was diagnosed with binge drinking, and I was um, I had to see a counsellor for eight weeks and all this sort of thing. So I went through the proper process to, to make sure that mm. I was going to be okay. Um, people were saying, you know, it's un-Australian. Why, why would you bother dobbing on him and all this sort of thing? And and uh, it was taking its toll. And and you know, you talk to the other boys as well. Like the, they sort of we look back and we talk. We laugh about it now. Sort of to a to a point, but um, it was very destructive, I think, um, for us in the way that it was handled. You know, it didn't need to be handled like that. It was amazing how how politics and money and all that, and, and, and one man can become so influential in, in sport. And of course, the, the amazing punchline was you and Harbhajan playing IPL together. You're in the same room, I'd imagine, mm. you're sitting next to him on the same bus. Like, did you ever find peace? When I first turned up at Mumbai Indians, it was a very awkward dressing room. When I first walked in, I remember all the most of the Indian boys were there, and Harbhajan was certainly in the room. And um, I remember walking in, and he he sort of made a beeline for me to come over and say hello. But you could feel the tension in the room, and um, it was it was a good thing that he got up and came over because I, I was I was sort of I was over it by then. You know, I sort of thought this is never gonna. Never going to change. That's never going to change. It's done. And 
then when I got picked up in the second IPL auction to play with him, you know, you can imagine that all the whispers going on, how is this going to go down, you know? I suppose about a third of the way through the, the competition, we went to um, this wealthy fellow's place and he put on a big, big meal, uh, sort of a barbecue and drinks and that at his house for us. And there was, you know, he invited guests to meet people and what have you. And um, we'd had a few drinks and I remember Harbajan came across to me and he said, uh, he said, boss, can I speak to you for a minute outside? So we went out in the front yard and he said, look, I really want to apologise for what I said to you and what I did and I hope that I didn't cause you or your family and your friends, you know, too much difficulty, basically. And he sort of broke down in, in tears and uh, I shook his hand and I sort of gave him a hug. I said, look, mate, so as far as I'm concerned, it's dealt with. You know, I appreciate your apology, mate. And, um, you know, I hope you feel much better after that because I, I do, I really appreciate what you've said. And, um, yeah, we went back inside and had a few more drinks and I could see it, could, it really alleviated a weight off his shoulders. It was, um, it, was quite a, it was quite a special moment. Did it alleviate a weight off yours? Like, do you, do you, are you over it? Like, I, I know because some of your mates say that that broke Simo and, and he, he's never recaptured his faith in the game. Yeah, no, I, I just... I didn't. Yeah, no, it did. It, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't break me initially, but it, as you said earlier, I had no faith in the system. I didn't feel as though I had any support from the powers that be. You know, I, I'd done some silly things, but then at, at the moment where I just needed some support and, and the boys needed some support, it, it, was, it was non-existent virtually, mate, due to money and politics, and that kills me, that sort of behaviour. As you look back on your cricket career, are you satisfied with it? Like, are you at peace? No is probably the answer to that. Um, as a player, I suppose, you want to go out under your own terms. I've noticed that, you know, we've had a lot of great players that have gone out of, out of Australian cricket the wrong way. Um, I mean, I was in probably more in control of of my destination than a lot of the others, but you know, your Steve Wars, your your Alan Borders, your Matthew Haydens, did they go out the right way? I don't believe so, and that's a real shame for the service that they they were given. You know, they sort of once they were finished, they were they were sort of tossed out and gone. You know, not celebrated in the way that they should have been for being, you know, greats of greats of our game. When you left Australian cricket, I mean, it was a, a tough finish, wasn't it? In in some ways. Um, accusations like that and yet your old teammates are still very loyal to you it's almost as if Australian cricket the guys who you were great mates with had faded out it was a new scene that you no longer felt comfortable with was that basically it um, through my misdemeanors my contract was was torn up I was sent home and then I had a, a different contract to everyone else as, as I'm led to believe it's the, I'm the only Australian cricketer that's had a different contract to anyone else ever and in order for me to play for Australia again, I had to play under that contract, which was which was no, which was no drinking. And um, we were over in England for the 2020 World Cup, and the Origin was on, and we went to one of the Aussie bars to watch the Origin. And I suppose I sort of was of the opinion you don't watch Origin without having a beer, and I had a beer watching the Origin, and got in trouble for that, and got sent home, and that was that was pretty much nearing the end um, of of my international career. And I guess your career went south for the, for the final time when you missed a training session, didn't you, in Darwin to go fishing. Um, that was a bit of a... Was that the final straw or was that sort of miscommunication? That was, that was a miscommunication because I'd organised for one of the Territory's best barra fishermen to come fishing with me and what have you. So I'd had this organised months in advance and training got changed from um, the afternoon to the morning. And I'd gone fishing at five o'clock in the morning, and I, unbeknownst to me, the training had been changed. I get back from, you know, fishing all morning, and my phone's got 27 messages on it, five of them from Mike Hussey. You know, Roy, where the hell are you? Just told him, said, mate, training was soft. And he said, well, I got changed. And I said, well, mate, sorry, I didn't know. Um, anyway, so I got the old mate, you're not up here to go fishing, you're up here to play cricket for your country. I said, yeah, I understand that. So I said, it's just a complete miscommunication, mate. I, I haven't deliberately gone out here to, to annoy anyone. And they, and they just kept ramming down my throat, you're not up here to go fishing. And it really started to annoy me. 
And because I honestly crashed, this was genuine miscommunication. I'd made it my my point that this is this is rubbish. That you're going to penalise me for a genuine mistake. You know, I haven't. I'm trying to. I'm trying to be better. And um, so I got called back down 20 minutes later, and they said, "Well, you're going to be fine. You're going to be sent home." And, and um, that's the end of it. But all up, Andrew, it's been. Uh memorable career and I've loved your honesty and openness today. I could sit here all day and listen to your yarns but uh, I've heard the fish are biting so I better let you go. Thanks for joining us on Cricket Legends. No worries. Thanks, Chris.